All right, so welcome to 4.1. We're going to be talking about um, consciousness as well as the sleeve cycle. So moving to a new unit, um, we're going to be focusing on consciousness in general, um, as well as sleep cycle and um, human memories. There is a, a deep connection between um, our sleep, our sleep cycle, the amount of sleep we're getting, and our ability to form and create memories, which is why we combine these two into one unit. So 4.1 consciousness is what we're going to be talking about first. So um, consciousness as a whole, there are multiple theories around this. If you're going back to um, kind of the Freudian way of things, everything was always referred to this as like iceberg, right? We have this 10% consciousness and about 90% subconscious. Um, and while we may not be as simple as that id, ego, and superego that, id li that uh, Freud likes to refer to us as, um, this is still relatively accurate, right? That our conscious mind is a very small part of what our body is actually doing. Much of what our brain is processing is subconscious, right? That parallel processing that we have the ability to, our brain is kind of on autopilot a lot of the time and we don't really notice it. What we're actually conscious of um, is, not, is not a big part of our experience, right? Like if I tell you right now, um, think about the feeling of the socks on your feet, right? You weren't conscious of the socks on your feet before I said that, but now all of a sudden your brain is thinking about it. So um, consciousness is general. A quick definition is our awareness of ourselves and of our environment. You have to have two things for that. It's both arousal, so we have to be like awake, um, and also awareness. We need to have both of those things at the same time. And necessary brain parts, the brain stem is probably the most important when we're talking about consciousness. There are things like the reticular formation and the pons both uh, regulate that the thalamus, um, because again, our sensations, we have to be aware of those, um, aroused by some form of sensation. And then our cerebral cortex is how we process those things, right? Things like the somatosensory cortex. So dual processing, that parallel processing uh, versus selective attention, right? There's a number of different states of consciousness. We won't talk about all of them, but things like daydreaming, doubt, drowsiness, um, right? uh, hallucination, orgasm, oxygen, starvation, meditation, hypnosis, um, dreaming. All of these are different states of consciousness. So most of what we're going to focus on is sleep, um, drowsiness, and daydreaming. Um, but we will also talk about other things like hallucinations hallucinations, um, or drug-induced different states of consciousness, um, others. We will not talk about hypnosis as it's been removed from the AP Psych um, kind of lexicon. It's no longer taught on AP Psychology because it's just too debated. There's definitely proof that hypnosis is a thing, um, but there's not enough evidence on it, and it's not exactly something that is super, it's not super scientifically driven, so we were going to remove it from psychology for that reason. So we're measuring consciousness. We know about all those different types of tools to study the brain. Um, the ones that is used for consciousness is the EEG, right? That um, electroencephalogram, which is studying the activity of the brain, right? And the kind of different waves that are happening, the neural firing pattern. Right, it's not what parts of the brain are active. We could use a PET scan for that. This is studying um, the way that the brain is firing, the rate at which the neurons are firing within the brain. Because even when we're asleep, parts of our brain are active. So the PET scan wouldn't be as useful. Whereas the EEGs, we can see different patterns in neural firing that tells us if someone is awake, asleep, having hallucin hallucinations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are some disorders of consciousness that you can be aware of. Primarily, um, the only one that we're really going to talk about is right coma. Right, thinking about uh, the coma and then kind of what that looks like. Right, there are different kind of paths that you go through there. But of course, an acute brain injury, usually some form of trauma um, or contact with the brain. Strokes can also cause this, but mostly um, you think of like physical acute brain injury causing a coma, um, which can lead to a number of different scenarios. For the most part, the most common route that that happens is two to three days of a coma, um, moving into a kind of vegetative state, and then moving out of that into a minimally conscious state where people are kind of aware of the things, and then slow um, recovery of consciousness after that. But it can, it can go in a number of ways, right? A coma could also could quickly recover from that and be normal. You can also um, have a brain death, right, where your brain is essentially completely useless. And then extremely rare, you would see locked-in syndrome, um, which is a form of paralysis for a while, or where you can be stuck, where you are completely paralyzed, entirely um, unable to move or show any reflexes or symbol like responses to anything, but you are conscious of all of it. So a very kind of terrifying thing, um, and it, it's pretty tough to diagnose and find as well. Uh, but we'll talk about the, the kind of normal path real quick. So disorders of consciousness, that normal path of coma, vegetative state, 
from a conscious state. Um, differences between those initially a coma is zero arousal um, or awareness, however the brain is working, right? Um, so you still are con not, not so much conscious, you are still functioning, right? Your brain is keeping you alive. It's keeping uh, most of your, your body doing what it needs to, uh, but it does need some guidance. For instance, you aren't able to breathe in a coma, right? You need some breathing assistance. So you'd be on a ventilator. It would be doing the work for you. Um, as you move out of a coma, it's usually a good sign when you're able to be removed from those breathing tubes um, into this vegetative state in which you're awake, right? Your eyes are open in this one, which they are not in a coma, um, but you have no awareness, right? So your brainstem is working just fine. You are, you seem to be awake. You seem to be doing things. You're breathing just fine, um, but you're not showing any consciousness, right? You're not showing any awareness of the things around you. Your cortex and your thalamus aren't receiving input, right? You're not going to let people poke you um, if they like give you a sharp poke in a vegetative state. Uh, likelihood is you're not going to respond. You can there there can be very small responses, but for the most part, no, no sign of true awareness of the things that are happening. Um, um, and the minimally conscious state is just what it sounds. You're moving more closer and closer to recovery, small amounts of awareness, small amounts of awareness, um, but it's inconsistent, right? You, you don't respond to everything. Um, and so it's slowly moving towards that recovery state of consciousness. All right, so let's talk about um, the main forms of consciousness and uh, states of consciousness you're going to need to know are surrounding sleep. We're going to spend about half this unit talking about sleep, the sleep cycle, dreaming, and all that good stuff. So let's talk about that real quick. So uh, reasons why we sleep. Um, this is still debated, right? There's a lot of um, evidence growing as for a couple of different reasons why we sleep, or different theories why we sleep. Uh, but the key theories are, one, evolutionary. It's advantageous to be asleep at night, right? Like people that their bodies encouraged them to, you know, go into a cave and not do anything during the hours of you know, when the sun wasn't out were much less likely to get eaten by a bear or trip and hurt themselves or do something in the dark, right? So um, it's advantageous for our bodies to be asleep. So as a, you know, caveman um, back in the day, it was very, very advantageous to be asleep, go in a cave, close your eyes, get away from scary animals or anything else at night. Um, it's also been shown that it helps us recuperate, recover both our body and our brain. It's like a much needed rest for those that they can have a chance to kind of flush out some things that have been building up. It is um, it more and more the, the most like clear evidence linked has been to memory formation. Um, we are able to uh, uh, kind of clear out. This is almost like mouthwash, kind of for the for the brain, right? You're you're when you're sleeping, your brain is like getting rid of uh, stuff that you learned throughout the day that isn't important, and it's strengthening stuff that you did do, right? It's why there's not a lot of effect. You would be much better off sleeping, um, and for a couple nights, for like studying an hour for three nights in a row, getting a good amount of sleep, but then for pulling an all-nighter the night before, studying for a test, uh, because you need your brain to be able to form those actual memories. If you pull an all-nighter the night before the test, you're not going to remember that long-term, right? You might be able to retain some of it for the test, but it will be gone uh, because you didn't, uh, by, your, by the time you get to the final or something like that, because didn't have that sleep to to create those memories. It's why getting six to eight hours of sleep um, at minimum is really, really important to be able to form memories and, you know, for learning. Uh, and then also growth, right? So for children, it's extremely important to get enough sleep because that's where we are, like, our pituitary glands are active. We're releasing growth hormones. It's also for adults. Um, or for athletes, it's where muscle recovery happens. So uh, stage three, stage four, um, those delta waves help people kind of flush out the toxins that build up, um, build up the, the acid that's built up in your muscles and kind of get, release new growth hormones so your muscles recover faster and you're able to you know, exercise again. So um, that changes over our lifetime, right? As a child, you need you know one to 15 days. They're sleeping 16 hours of the day. Right, two to three year olds are sleeping over 12 hours of the day um, and you're all stage 14 to 18. You should be getting me between nine to 10 hours of sleep. I know you're probably not getting it, uh, but you should try to get a decent amount of sleep because that's where you're forming those neural connections. Right. You're you're in that pruning phase um, and where you're like cleaning out the stuff that you don't know, the, don't need. And the more you're able to sleep, the more you're able to do that. And so for me, it's 19 to 30, almost into the, 30, the older stage, uh, 19 to 30, right? I need around eight hours of sleep. That's probably about what I usually get. Um, but as you age, you know, for the oldest, 70 plus, you really are only getting four to six hours of sleep a night. 
uh, are necessary, right? You're not, you don't need your body to like recover from exercise you know, as much. You don't need your body to be learning, memorizing bunch, bunches of things in the same. So um, different things. There are two biggies you really know for sleep. One is circadian rhythm. The second are uh, your different stages of sleep, the different sleep, the sleep cycle. So circadian rhythm is a biggie. We've got another Ed Puzzle to watch just on that. And this is kind of our biological clock. Definitely think of circadian rhythm as a clock. Um, it keeps our body on more or less a 24-hour cycle. Um, we, uh, it tells us when we need to go to sleep. It releases information and melatonin that says, hey, it's sleepy time. Let's get ready for the big sleep. Um, or at the same time, it, it wakes us up in the morning, right? It's often kind of synced up with the sun. We get a lot of, of hints as to when things are happening. Um, but it's also very natural, right? Like, for instance, they, uh, they did a mammoth cave study um, and – when they removed the light in general. So I don't know if you know Mammoth Cave, shout out to Kentucky, um, is a national park. One of the largest, it is the largest cave system in the world. And a uh, psych researcher put uh, a couple, this is like in the 30s, but like four or five different people in Mammoth Cave, and he was down there with them. He did two weeks, and he kept them. He told them, um, I just wanted to test your sleep. That's all he said. And he kept them down there, but he kept them on a 28-hour sleep cycle where he didn't let them sleep. Um, as if the day was 24 hours, he told them that a new day was happening um, only every 28 hours instead, uh, trying to throw off and see if their their bodies would sync up to this new sleep cycle. And it didn't. Their bodies maintained a 23 to 25 hour circadian rhythm where it started telling them to it's time to be sleepy um, around the time where it would actually be bedtime. Right. So even if their their sleep cycle shifted forward or backwards, they still their body still went through a 23 to 25 hour. So on average, about a 24 hour sleep cycle um, or circadian rhythm, even though he was keeping them on a 28 hour cycle. Um, it really messed with the people's bodies because they were still on that 24 hour cycle, even though he forced them without any cues or anything that it was uh, that the day was that there was no light. Right. So there was nothing, no, no hints that this was happening. Um, and they still maintain. That. So within the brain, a big vocab term, you know, the SEN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is part of our hypothalamus. It is a series or a bundle of nerves in the hypothalamus that controls our pineal gland secretions, it's primarily melatonin, or that's one of those big um, hormones that helps us sleep, sends the messages that, hey, it's sleepy time. Um, so uh, a couple different things affect that light is a biggie, especially blue light, like the blue light that comes from your cell phone. So, um, one of the best things you can do is don't look at your screens before bed. If you really have trouble sleeping, um, don't sleep with your phone next to your bed. Don't sit there in bed for 20 minutes, staring at your phone being like, I can't sleep. I'm going to flip through Instagram. Um, that's the absolute worst thing you can do for your sleep. Your brain um, sees light and thinks, oh, it must be time to wake up. Um, and even though your your brain, your body is still trying to shut down, your super chiasmatic nucleus is super confused, right? Because it's getting this blue light. So you're not going to get enough of that melatonin. Even though the rest of your body is starting to shut down for sleep, your consciousness is going to have a hard time fading away because of those lights. So sleep in a dark room, do what you can to give yourself all the help. Um, within like an hour or two before bed, try to remove screens. It's hard. I'm bad at it too. But the more we do this, the better we will sleep and the better we will recover and be awake during the day. Uh, there is evidence of a nap zone, right? The second most highly reported period of the day where we're sleepy is between 2 to 3 p.m. Um, there is some evidence that that's helpful. Uh, um, there is no evidence, however, of three to four hour naps being helpful. So Naps are, can be beneficial, but they are primarily more of a like you should keep them less than an hour for sure, right? If you want to, uh, I strongly recommend this like coffee nap. I've got a video up here talking about that. It's like a 45 minute nap where um, I, I like to do it with like uh, make coffee, get it cold so that I can drink it really, really fast. Coffee takes like 20 to 30 minutes to kick in. So, like, you get ready for bed, you like chug some coffee, fall asleep. And then 45 minutes later, like you wake up and the coffee has kicked in. So you're feeling super awake because of that. But you also got all the benefits of that nap. You also got to sleep, right? The coffee won't wake you up. Your sleep cycle will wake you up. So, or your alarm for 45 minutes will wake you up. So um, coffee naps, big fan. And then um, genetically, we have different reasons for people that are either owls or larks. They're either evening people or morning people. I'm very much a morning person. My wife is very much an evening person struggle with that at times, uh, but that's definitely something, and that can change over time as well.
So um, second biggie you need to know are the sleep cycles. We do when we sleep, we're not all doing the same thing all night, right? We are going through these different periods of um, a kind of wakefulness, dreaming, sleep, deep sleep, or completely unable to rest. When we go through a night, right, we hope that we're in different stages, right? Where we're either dreaming or we're in deep sleep or we're in light sleep or we're transitioning between those. And so a sleep cycle is like this, right? It's the stage from REM sleep down into deep sleep, back up into REM sleep. Okay, so that's what that looks like. Uh, they're typically around 90 minutes. Um, you want to wake up in REM sleep because it's the closest to awake sleep. Whenever you wake up from REM, you're going to feel much better, right? When you wake up on mornings and you remember your dreams, um, it's because you woke up in REM sleep and you probably feel better on those days. On days when you wake up and you don't remember your dreams immediately, it's you were probably feeling sleepier because you were stuck in like a deep sleep. When you get awoken out of a deep sleep, it's really hard to wake up. You're going to take a long time to get back to wakefulness because your body's still stuck down here. So as you age, you spend less time in this REM sleep, but REM sleep is um, uh, very beneficial for most of the theories say it's for formation of memories and for getting rid of stuff we don't know, which is why it's kind of this hallucinatory state. Our brain is almost like exercising a little bit. It's, it's like firing as a way to create memories, um, not so much of our dreams, but of the different things that happened to us. So different stages of sleep, one through five, not really a fifth, but really REM sleep. So two different things you know, in REM and REM, these are rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement. Those are two different types of sleep. Most of our sleep is in REM. So stage one, two, three, and four are in REM. And then our fifth stage is just REM sleep. So um, different waves that are happening when we're sleeping. Again, this is the EEG. When you're doing sleep studies, you're going to use an EEG. So when you're awake and relaxed, you're, you're kicking out these kind of alpha waves. These are right before you fall asleep. Um, this is not like awake and excited about something. These are just kind of chill, right? Think of this is laying in bed. This is not really doing anything, not being stimulated by much of anything at all, right? Like even meditation kind of help us reach this kind of alpha stage where we're Next, there's no stress happening. Our body realizes it's safe for us to close our eyes and sleep. So we're in this alpha stage, and then we go through these different stages. So let's talk about each one of them. Stage one um, is kind of irregular, right? They're, they're close to alpha waves. We don't see it as that different. Um, you can kind of see the difference here. It's our, our breathing is starting to slow down. We're kind of preparing for sleep. This is only about 15 to 20 minutes total um, in stage one. Some interesting things that happen there. I'm sure you've all experienced this, this hypnagogic. Uh, hallucination or hypnagogic sensations is, uh, you know, that like feeling of falling, right? Um, that's usually not something that happens in our dream. I think that oftentimes media or the movies portray it like that, but really what's happening is, with hypnagogic hallucinations is right before we fall asleep. This is definitely when it happens to me, um, right? That feeling of you, you're falling asleep and you think you're asleep and you're kind of pseudo dreaming almost and you are hallucinating basically which is what a dream is and you think you're falling and you jump really quick and your hands reap up trying to catch yourself but really you're still in bed so that's happening in stage one um so stage two we see a couple different things this one's also about 20 minutes um and within stage two we get a much more kind of all over the place types of sleep two different things you know there's sleep spindles and k complexes sleep spindles are these different bursts of brain activities and the brain is inhibiting mental processes in order to promote um, less consciousness. So basically, like the brain is trying to wake up and sleep spindles is the brain um, firing to basically suppress those and say, no, we're going to sleep. We're going into deeper sleep. Right. I know you want to get back to wakefulness, but no, we're going down. We're going down to sleepy town. Um, K complexes are these kind of all over the place brain waves in which the um, cortex is stimulated. But again, it's suppression. So sleep two is all about forcing us into a deeper stage of sleep. It's keeping us to like state. You get these K complexes. Like if somebody like comes up and maybe um, like, you know, just like touches your arm, right? Maybe not enough to wake you up, but definitely enough to kind of set off some brain activity. And it's why people don't wake up immediately if you just touch them. Their brain is reacting to it most likely, but they may not get back to consciousness. K-complexes do that. Stage three is quick, right? It's only a few minutes, but it's a transition phase. And the waves are different than we get to stage four. It's kind of a transition between two and three. We're starting the production of these delta waves, large, slow brain waves that helped with deep sleep. This is where the money's at when it comes to memory formation and when it comes to um, physical recovery. 
If you're not getting enough stage three, stage four sleep, you're going to feel more tired. Your muscles are going to be more sore. You're not going to be able to recover quickly from um, fatigue. So that's stage four, mostly you known for delta waves, deep sleep. It's hard to awake during this stage. Uh, sleepwalking, bedwetting, night terrors, all of that people I think often associate with dreaming, but they're actually in your deepest of deep sleeps whenever you're sleepwalking. Um, that's why it's really hard to wake somebody up when they're sleepwalking. It's not because they're dreaming. If they're dreaming, it'd be easy to wake them up. But in stage four, you almost can't wake people up, um, right? It's sleepwalking. It's all happening there in stage four super deep. So after stage four, you pretty quickly actually come out of stage four, rapidly move into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep in which dreaming occurs. So all of our dreaming is going to be happening in this REM sleep in which our um, brain waves look much more like our conscious state, right? It's pretty similar to our conscious state um, in which your eyes are moving around, but it's called paradoxical sleep because you're body is kind of paralyzed, right? Like whenever you're, um, if you see somebody like rolling back and forth and their body is like shaking around, it's like, oh no, you must've been having a bad dream. It's like, no, actually they were probably in um, deep sleep. And so they're not going to remember what was happening or they uh, were in stage one, in which they're having those like hypnagogic hallucinations. Right? Most people in REM sleep aren't going to have those kind of like fitful rolling around stages, right? REM sleep, you're actually like more or less paralyzed. Um, you're not going to be moving at all, but except for your eyes. So shorter brain waves, heart rate and breathing are, rises, uh, more arousal in general. We get these hallucinatory, vivid dreams. Um, and as you sleep, the more stages you go through, the longer your REM sleep will go. So you see that, right? If you go through um, these different sleep state, sleep cycles, one, two, three, all the way through the fourth one, your fourth room sleep can be as long as, you know, 30 to 60 minutes in that six to seven, six to eight hours of sleep stage. Um, so that's like as the rooms, this is when you're supposed to wake up to be the most conscious and aware. You'll be the most likely to wake up. It's easiest to wake someone up during REM sleep. So 30 to 60 minutes of six, seven is because now it's getting closer to time we wake up, right? You don't have a big window to wake up after your first cycle because you don't, your body doesn't want to wake up. It doesn't need to, it needs more cycles to recover. So that is it. Uh, next time we'll talk more about dreaming and some of the theories around that, why we dream. Remember, right? You should be keeping track this unit of your dreams. So that is it for the day. Um, I will see y'all when I see you.